Hello, uh, my name is uh, Gancho Slavov, uh, and I, will, I work at Cyan, and I will be presenting today about uh, genomic prediction and its applications in th tree breeding, conservation, and mitigation of climate change. So as most things in um, modern science, I would like to first uh, acknowledge the fact that this is the product of teamwork and acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Yaroslav uh, in particular, for running a lot of the analysis, Mark Paget from the Radiata Pine Breeding Company for con uh, helping conceive many of the research questions, Natalie and Ahmed uh, for, for helping clean up the data and making sense of things that were at first quite puzzling, and uh, Heidi um, for her leadership. This uh, was funded by MB and the Radiata Pine Breeding Company as part of a collaboration agreement between Scion and the RPBC. Uh, just very quickly, um, uh, an introduction to the subject matter of quantitative traits and genetic architectures. This is Pascal's triangle, which for those of you fascinated uh, with probability theory as I am, uh, will remember has the binomial expansion coefficients, but um, that also means that they give the segregation patterns for a trait controlled by a single locus or a single gene. So that's one to two to one. Uh, for two loci, um, then uh, and then three loci, etc. And as you see, as the more as the trait is controlled by more and more genes, it uh, starts resembling a normal distribution. And above uh, on the photo is the observed distribution of human heights, uh, which is the genetic trait that has been studied studied the longest, um, you know, um, over a century of history of studying that that trait. Uh, and again, just a definition that a quantitative trait is a trait controlled by a large number of uh, genes or loci uh, affected by both genetics and environment. And what we mean by genetic architecture is uh, an understanding of the complete set of genes that control a trait and also their uh, interactions. Uh, we now know uh, quite a few of the um, loci that affect human height. Uh, this was published uh, about 10 years ago. and Back then, uh, it, the number was in the hundreds. Now it's more in the thousands, possibly even tens of thousands of um, genes that are known to affect human height. Um, will we ever know the complete genetic architectures of traits? Probably not. So this is again an example uh, based on uh, uh, human studies that show that uh, to um, understand, for example, um, the complete genetic architecture of human height, uh, it, that may not be possible until the human population has reached 10 billion and we are able to sequence um, all human uh, beings on the planet. So uh, for practical uh, purposes, we can assume that that will never happen uh, in our lifetimes anyway. Um, but uh, more pragmatic technology has come around uh, that allows us uh, to um, predict phenotypic traits from a large number of markers across the genome without uh, testing uh, the statistical significance of each marker. Um, and this is, has been called genomic selection because it allows breeders to make selections uh, early on in the breeding cycle uh, based on DNA data as opposed to uh, testing. How does it work or how do we know it works? Uh, we take, uh, um, we're take currently able to take uh, data sets retrospectively where we have both phenotypes and genotypes, so DNA genotypes, and then uh, train a model based on uh, the vast majority of the data, based on the phenotypes and genotypes and the statistical relationships between them, and then predict the phenotypes for a subset uh, where we only use the DNA marker data. And then we can calculate the correlation between the predicted and observed uh, phenotypes and uh, quantify um, predictive ability. That's the, um, uh, again, we, we measure that through the correlation of observed and predicted phenotypes. Where is that going to make an impact in, uh, in tree breeding? Uh, obviously in field trials where instead of waiting for uh, a number of years before we can collect uh, data on growth and possibly even more years before we can collect data on wood quality, we can make these predictions very early on, um, essentially as soon as we are able to get enough needles to extract DNA, which is just, uh, just a few months. Um, where are we with Radiata Pine and where are others across the world? Um, the implementation of genomic selection, uh, the technology I just explained, is the main goal of the um, RPVC Scion collaboration agreement. Um, and uh, the Radiata Pine Breeding Company has made a very ambitious investment in genotyping. Uh, over 
10,000 trees have been genotyped with the current technology, with, which costs about um, 30 to 35 uh, dollars per tree. And it has already enabled significant improvements in the pedigree information used by, by the uh, RPBC. So when we first started looking at the data, roughly one out of four first degree relationships was inconsistent between the records and the DNA um, evidence. Uh, meaning that there was likely uh, an error either in the records or in sampling um, the, the trees. So by various analysis, we were able to reduce these uh, discrepancies down to under 5%, which is on par with um, um, sort of world leading uh, breeding programs. Uh, so they're a very good indicator and it has measurable impact on the uh, um, analysis uh, used to um, calculate breeding values. We'll see an example of that uh, later on. Um, so um, assessments of genomic selection are underway, uh, underway elsewhere across the world, uh, but on, uh, generally on a much smaller scale. So what we would like to know is can we use genomic selection to make predictions across different breeding populations? Uh, also, can we use it for, for making predictions within families, particularly within um, controlled pollinated families? and across entire uh, series of trials, including trials that have not been genotyped. So we have everything we need to answer these questions uh, uh, with uh, a sort, of, a sort of convincing confidence because of the large data sets that we have. So um, one of the, just a quick, quick explanation of what we did, we um, assembled data sets from older clonal tests. So these are 397 and 399 series a QTL mapping family that we use to test uh, within family prediction, and perhaps most importantly, cloned elites, which is the um, sort of the focal population for the Radiata Pine Breeding Company, but also for seed producers. So what, in the first instance, what we were trying to answer is, can we train a model based on the older clonal tests primarily and do predictions within the cloned elites? Um, and the answer to that was yes. So just to explain this graph, um, on, uh, on the left, on the X uh, axis, we have the number of genotypes from the clone deletes that were included in the training population, and that varied from zero to 300. Zero being that we never test anything from the new population. We just make the predictions based on existing populations. And you can see that even with that, we were able to get predictive ability of roughly 0.2 for DBH, uh, diameter breast height, and just over 0.4 for wood density. But with testing as few as 100 genotypes uh, from the new uh, series, uh, from that new population. Um, those numbers increased roughly by uh, 50%. So now the uh, predictive ability for um, DBH is closer to 0.3 and closer to 0.6 for wood quality. So um, again, we're, even with minimum te minimal testing, we can uh, achieve reasonably uh, good uh, predictive accuracy. The other the other graph uh, illustrates how many markers or how many SNPs are necessary to achieve these predictive abilities. And what uh, I think is good news is that we don't seem to need the entire set of 30,000 SNPs that are currently on, on, on the genotyping platform. We, we might be able to achieve that with a much smaller number of markers. So this is just an illustration of random samples. So not taking into consideration the information content of the SNPs, which we could do, just selecting them at random. So even a randomly selected subset of 2000 markers gives you just about as much predictive ability as the whole set. So similar uh, question was about uh, the ability to predict um, um, within families or in other words, one, once there is uh, a family identified between promising parents, can we also do ranking of um, uh, phenotypes within that family? So this is where we train the model in um, the clonal, clone deletes and older tests uh, and the predictions within a family that we've um, generated for QTL um, mapping purposes. And that also worked fairly well for wood density. You see that again, with even with uh, zero uh, individuals from the family included in the training set, we're able to recover uh, predictive ability of 0.6. Not so well for uh, DBH, where um, um, then pursued that and a separate analysis that I won't present illustrated that in order to do predictions for DBH, one just needs to grow about 20 to 30 individuals for, for the family. So. Where that leaves us is that we are able to do uh, uh, within 
family predictions and genomic selection for wood density uh, without uh, testing any individuals from that family. If we want to also uh, do predictions for growth, uh, we have to test about 20 to 30. And once again, uh, the graph on the right uh, shows that we don't require that many markers to do that, about two to 3,000 will do the trick. Um, then another um, important point is that even with the uh, most ambitious investments in genotyping, we were not going to be able to genotype everything. So a single step evaluation analysis is where we can combine data between genotyped and uh, non-genotyped uh, trials uh, and trial series uh, for predictions. Uh, and we tested that, um, and as this is a quite of a kind of a complex table, but what it shows is that for the cloned elites, if we just went with the uh, conventional currently available approach, we would get a predictive accuracy of 0.2. If we use genomics and merged genotyped and non-genotyped uh, trial series, we can nearly double that to 0.23. And again, there's a, a lot of variables in terms of how the um, how the genotype and non-genotype data is merged, but that's uh, perhaps irrelevant. Great potential there to combine uh, ser trial series and populations. Um, there's also quite a bit of interest in producing new hybrids, uh, which um, might be very important for um, habitats that are not currently suitable for radiata pine. Um, the current timeline for various reasons for developing new hybrids is, is quite long, um, something like you know, perhaps 20, 30 years. But with genomic selection, we think we can uh, reduce that substantially, possibly even half it. And finally, uh, breeding is not, as indicated by my title, the breeding, uh, breeding is not the only place where genomic prediction will have an impact. Um, we often assume that loco is best, including in eco-sourcing, but increasing evidence shows that many trees have actually adapted to climates that are already gone and will continue to change in the future. Um, so what then becomes important is being able to match uh, genotypes not, not only to the current climates, but also to the, to the expected future climates. And the state-of-the-art approach for doing that is uh, essentially putting up a bunch of field trials um, in, in different environments and then testing a lot of populations or provenances. This works really well, but it only starts working well when you have a large number of test sites. So genomics uh, potentially allows us to uh, shortcut some of that and make some of these decisions based on smaller numbers of, uh, some numbers of trials, which will be particularly important for indigenous species. So in summary, uh, we know well that, um, now we, we know that genomic selection works well in radiata pine and will allow us to do um, things in new ways, particularly uh, for wood density where we can uh, make predictions across populations, across series and within families without testing any individuals from the, for the family. Uh, for DBH, we could do many of the same things, but um, probably a, a more conservative recommendation is to test 20% of each new generation in series but this is still a significant reduction of field trial costs. And a lower cost genotyping platform that ho hopefully uh, will cost roughly half of what the current one does uh, is under development and will be available next year. And we also have preliminary results to indicate that this technology will work very well in Douglas fir and eucalyptus. So please see uh, Toby Sowell's presentation on that. Um, and finally, the, um, a point that the genomic prediction can be used for not only for breeding, but also for mitigating the effects of climate change in both exotic and indigenous tree species um, by matching provenances to uh, future climates. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, um, um, wish you um, a pleasant, uh, pleasant conference.